Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Q&A session with our experts, Dr. Kyle Blackburn and Dr. Jonathan Galley. My name is Chrissy Dilger, and I am the Manager of Research and Programs at the Siegel Rare Neuroimmune Association. So first, I just wanted to say thank you both for joining us today and answering some of these questions. Yeah, my pleasure. So to start off, Dr. Galley, can you just tell us what causes TM and have any predisposing factors been identified? Yeah, that's a great question. Whenever I'm kind of meeting a patient for, for the first time who's getting a diagnosis of transverse myelitis, what I like to kind of explain to them is, is transverse myelitis generally is kind of an umbrella term for the for, for an inflammatory spinal cord lesion. And what causes it can be be one of many diff, you know, different diagnoses. You know, one common cause of it is uh, multiple sclerosis, but there are other rheumatological conditions, other autoimmune conditions that can cause it. But sometimes we don't find, quote, a, a, a cause, if you will, and it ends up being either, sometimes it can happen post-viral, and sometimes you can get it post-infectious, things like that. Sometimes you can just develop it for no clear cause in which we call idiopathic. And so there's a myriad of different kind of causes to, of transverse myelitis, although oftentimes, again, it ends up being that idiopathic or, or post-infectious cause. Um, and then predisposing factors, certainly there's uh, genetic predisposition for certain autoimmune conditions and things along those lines. Um, but one thing that I always tell my, my patients who've developed transverse myelitis is that there was nothing really that you did that caused this. Because oftentimes that's something that I think patients come to me and they say, what did I do wrong? And, you know, really the answer is nothing. It was just kind of, you know, something that happened on its own. I don't know, Dr. Blackburn, if you wanted to expand on that at all. No, no, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. Nailed it. This is a condition that actually has a number of different causes. And I think the way that doctors sometimes talk about it is a little different than the way that, that patients do, because I think at the end of the day, our, our patients um, have been told they have transverse myelitis, and they're often thinking of that idiopathic condition. But I always like to emphasize when somebody comes to us with that label, we, you know, our job is to look for all of these other causes and, and make sure this is an even, even indeed inflammatory and not, and not something else. So we don't have neat underpinnings of what causes these, what we call idiopathic cases, the cases where we have not figured it out. But certainly there are a number of causes that we, that we have identified. And, and as we continue to progress, we're going to find more. Great. Thank you both. Those are, those are great answers. And I think hopefully, like you said, in the future, we'll, we'll expand on, on our knowledge from what we know right now. Our next question, what does idiopathic mean and what percentage of people with idiopathic TM have reoccurrence? Why does reoccurrence happen and does it worsen with each occurrence? Uh, Dr. Blackburn, do you want to start us off? Sure. So the word idiopathic is, it's basically, it's medical jargon, for lack of a better term. And it really just means a disease that does not have a known cause. So, so for example, as we were talking about earlier, when doctors talk about the umbrella of what transverse myelitis is, um, there are diseases like multiple sclerosis and diseases like NMO, which we talk about here at the SRNA, those diseases can cause transverse myelitis. But we refer to it as idiopathic when we've done all the workup and for you know everything that we've done and and considered, we just cannot identify the cause, and that will be under that umbrella of idiopathic um, transverse myelitis or idiopathic myelitis, depending on who you ask. The there's a question about what's the percentage of patients that have idiopathic TM have a recurrence. That's a really interesting question. So. Something that hasn't been investigated well, but I really think most of us agree that rate of, for somebody that has true idiopathic TM is extremely low. And in fact, if somebody were to have a relapse, I, I think 
many of the people that we work with are going to be reconsidering that diagnosis and, and potentially somebody may be mis reclassified as having multiple sclerosis, uh, depending on what that new evaluation yields. They may be reclassified as having a type of neuromyelitis optica. Um, I, whenever somebody has a recurrence, it's actually a red flag to me that we need to reconsider that idiopathic label and really dig deeper. And then, you know, they kind of ask, why does a recurrence happen? To kind of address that, I think there's a reason we don't understand why some of these conditions are relapsing, but what, what that typically tells me is that the immune system is for some reason persistently confused. Um, it is, it, it, there's a tendency for it to want to go back to the nervous system again and again, and that can warrant a different treatment approach as opposed to most of our idiopathic and, and those post-viral things that Dr. Galley was talking about. They tend to only occur once. And then the question, does it worsen with each occurrence that, you know, I can't say that having one relapse may necessarily predict that the next one is going to be worse. Um, but if certainly if someone's having relapses, that's a, a time when we may want to consider intervening. Dr. Galley, how do you feel about what I said there? Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think the really important point that Dr. Blackburn um, is making is you know, if, if somebody comes in, they, we, we say, yes, they have transverse myelitis. We do our workup. We don't see anything. So, so I, the way about it is our workup is looking for conditions that have a high risk of, of relapsing and causing further damage down the line. If we don't do anything again, if it's idiopathic, I think of that as a one-off event, a monophasic event. And if I have a patient that I suspect has idiopathic transverse myelitis and they develop another lesion, I will definitely go back to the drawing board and ask myself, what am I missing? Because, because kind of by the books, if you will, idiopathic or post-viral really shouldn't relapse. And so that's, that's a really important thing to think about. And, you know, because generally with, if somebody's had idiopathic transverse myelitis, I don't necessarily need them on long-term immune therapy because it's not something I suspect to come back. However, if somebody does have a condition that is, is causing relapsing transverse myelitis, that's somebody who I'm definitely going to totally uh, change that tr management plan and think about putting them on immune therapy to, to prevent a relapse. So, yeah. And I wanted to elaborate on one other point you brought up, Dr. Galli. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, the most of these idiopathic patients are not going to relapse. And I have had people that have true idiopathic TM come to, to, come to us and say, I've had four to five relapses. And we look at imaging and, and kind of the symptoms they were experiencing. And, and we don't really find anything that clearly backs that up. And, and I often find in most of those cases, if we really dig that there's there's just a misunderstanding of the, of a temporary worsening of symptoms that, that sometimes what you'll hear in MS world called UTOPS phenomenon and a relapse. And certainly when somebody's having a worsening of their symptoms, ob the obvious concern is this is a relapse, but the, the symptoms that these diseases cause can fluctuate wildly and, and can temporarily worsen with a lot of triggers. I'm in Texas today and it's about to hit hundred degrees. And I'm not looking forward to it. And, and, but many of our patients have learned over the years that they may notice worsening of their symptoms during those times. And it's something that we try to counsel about because we, we certainly want to avoid people getting treatments they don't need because they're having a temporary worsening of symptoms due to a, just a, a physical stressor on the body. Got it. Thank you so much. Hey, our next question is for someone whose TM occurred after receiving a vaccine and no other possible causes were found, can they get vaccinated after their TM onset? Yeah, this is a great question. I generally will encourage my patients to, to get vaccinated. There's some suggestion that, you know, this, that some of you can get post vaccine inflammatory events. That data certainly, you know, in the MS world has not really borne out. And I oftentimes will tell patients, your risk of, of having this occur again is, is, in my mind, so low that the, the benefit of getting the vaccine and preventing something like influenza, COVID now, 
that benefit outweighs any risk. And I also like to also kind of counsel patients and tell them, you know, we, we also know that there can be neurological complications from things like influenza, COVID, and things like that. So that's generally how I go about counseling my patients. Do you agree, Dr. Blackburn? Oh, absolutely. I, when I, if somebody comes to us with idiopathic transverse myelitis and then it seems to be closely tied to a vaccine, we, we tend to kind of counsel them in the exact same way. That is really thought to be a one-time event. And while it's completely understandable to be very hesitant about a vaccine in that setting, the, the data that we have and, and really the the risk of this recurring seems to be exceedingly low. And even some of the data, I think from Guillain-Barre, where there, there was some data to suggest that maybe a flu vaccine at some point may have been able to trigger the uh, trigger a Guillain-Barre syndrome, suggests two things. One, that the risk, I think as Dr. Gallius talked about, the risk of having a neurological issue from the virus is higher than the vaccine. And then two, that vaccinating down the road did not seem to have a recurrence. So I, I tend to extrapolate that to our myelitis patients and say that this risk is very low. And you know, I can only speak from experience, but my, my patients that have gone through and gotten vaccinated really have, have we've never seen a recurrence. Okay, thank you. I think that'll be helpful for a lot of people who are you know trying to make these sure. tough decisions. Um, our next question was a community question we got um, about advocacy for oneself in a clinical setting. So what advice would you give to patients about how to advocate for themselves with medical professionals? For example, maybe something's not working for them and the patient thinks that, you know, they better understand what would work for them. Um, are there any advice you have about going about these conversations? Um, Dr. Blackburn, if you want to start us off. Sure. And, and this is always a really big struggle. There's definitely a power dynamic in, in a doctor-patient relationship. And, and I, I think it's really important to try to diffuse that. If some part of a treatment plan isn't working for you, I think it's important that, that, you, that, I, that you as an individual feel imperative to speak up. I, I will say most of the time, your doctor isn't actually going to be aware of that. They, if they're going to assume that treatments, you're taking treatment, if for example, treatment's not, is giving you issues and you're actually not taking it, they're going to assume that you're, you're not having side effects unless you speak up to it. As, as you all may have experienced, it can be a, a pretty busy place to be a clinic. So I, I always encourage people to be very vocal about what their needs are and, and, and how we can help. So I, and I know sometimes that's, that can be tough to do. And sometimes it's some, it's even harder to be heard, even if you are being vocal. And, and I think it's, it's really important to recognize that just like in other industries, it's really important to have a good relationship with your doctors and, and other providers and to feel comfortable with them. And if you're really feeling that you're not being heard, I, I think, you know, kind of revisiting a second opinion and finding other places is appropriate at that point. So I absolutely encourage my patients to speak up when there's issues. And, and I really think people should. Yeah, I, I really agree with that. I, and it's, you know, I, I will say this and I will also be, preface it by acknowledging like logistically, sometimes this, what I'm about to say isn't possible from an insurance standpoint, a, a location standpoint, but I think it's really important for that relationship between, especially in our populations of, of, you know, these rare, rare conditions that you find a provider that you feel comfortable with and really someone that listens. I think it's always probably a good idea to have a neurologist on board who at least on, even if they're general, cause they should at least understand these basic symptoms and management, you know, Dr. Blackburn and I see this day in day out. So, <laughs> you know, I, I actually, when I do an intake on a patient, you know, I actually have a list of potential symptoms that I just commonly see that I run through, like, so you don't even have to be like, Oh, by the way, I'm having neuropathic pain. Like we've already, that's, that's going to be talked about. Right. And like, I'm going to address that every visit. And so, 
I think someone who's, you know, when you see a provider who's really comfortable with the condition, it, it's, it's probably the easiest to have these discussions because, because we know what, we know what you're probably going through and we've seen it. It's not anything that, you know, if I have a patient who's had transverse myelitis for 10 years and they say, you know, my left arm pain is worse again, I've seen that. And so I'm comfortable at it and I believe them. Right. So like, you know, I think just, just finding at least a neurologist, I think is always helpful if you can. And I always encourage if possible, seeking a second opinion, if you're your provider, you know, and you just don't gel or you don't feel listened to. I mean, I always tell my patients, like, if you want a second opinion, like it doesn't hurt my feelings. Right. So again, also logistically that may be challenging and I, I understand that and it's hard. Probably what I would recommend. Yeah, it, it is hard, but you know, these are important, important considerations, you know. What percentage of individuals, women and men, develop MS post TM diagnosis? Can someone have a diagnosis of TM at the same time as a diagnosis of MS, NMOSD, MOGAD, or another disorder? Dr. Galley, if you want to start us off. Yeah, I, I would actually have to pull, pull up the data. I forget off the top of my head what percentage of patients with TM go on to develop MS. I forget the exact number. I apologize. But when we're when I see somebody with transverse myelitis, MS is always kind of on the differential, if you will, the potential cause of it. And how we risk, risk stratify that is really with brain imaging to see if you have lesions in your brain as well, because those patients have a high likelihood of going on to develop MS versus if someone's got brain imaging and there, there's no lesions, they have a very low risk in general of going on to develop MS. And part of the evaluation, again, as we kind of and I'm trying to answer this and not confuse even myself here, but you can have transverse myelitis, which leads to a diagnosis of MS, NMO, MOG, and other things. So you certainly can have them. Typically, we don't see like MS plus MOG plus things like that, but you, you can have transverse myelitis secondary to one of these conditions and it be your, your presenting symptom. So... I'm sorry, Dr. Blackburn, if you can clarify what I was just <laughs> No worries. This is, this is something that I do, that I do talk about a lot in clinic too. So I think as we were talking about earlier, transverse myelitis is, is kind of an umbrella of several different diagnoses. So yeah, somebody's first manifestation of MS could be quote unquote transverse myelitis. And then we either find at that time that they have other evidence to suggest that they actually have MS or later on, as you kind of talked about later on, it, it may become more apparent as they develop a second attack, which is characteristic of MS. And then of course we may initially have someone come to the hospital with transverse myelitis with inflammation in their spinal cord. And at that point we may say, this is your diagnosis. And, and this is where people get confused and this, this process it's, it's a kind of an iterative process. It kind of is a feedback loop. We, you come into a hospital with this episode of transverse myelitis, or you come to a specialty center with that diagnosis and your doctors are supposed to say, huh, let's look at all the causes and figure out what's going on here. Eventually that label may be changed. So I always tell people, you know, you can, as you kind of alluded to, you can have this transverse myelitis secondary to MS or NMO or MOG, but you, you know, at that point it is no longer idiopathic. So I wouldn't label you with that quote unquote diagnosis of transverse myelitis when, when we actually mean idiopathic myelitis. So many, it's just that umbrella and TM can be a symptom of those, all of those diseases. But whenever somebody says it as their diagnosis, they usually mean idiopathic. So I, I really don't think those two can co-occur. Got it. Thank you so much for, for trying your best to answer that question. I, really <laughs> complicated I think we need figures for that one. Like yeah. here's, the, here's the breakdown. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to symptom management. What treatments are available to address numbness, nerve pain, and spasticity? 
Dr. Blackburn, if you want to start us off. Sure. So pretty big topic, but maybe the first thing I'll say is, is for numbness. Unfortunately, there, I don't think I can say that there's a primary medical or surgical treatment that's going to fix numbness, especially numbness due to um, spinal cord injuries like myelitis. So, you know, I sometimes see people that are miscommunicating with their doctors and their doctors think they're having nerve pain, um, but they're actually just having numbness. And, and at that, you know, medications like gabapentin and, and duloxetine aren't going to help that. So uh, unfortunately, that's the only thing that we have that will let that is is time and potentially your, your body's own processes <laughs> recovering it. But for the uncomfortable things like nerve pain and spasticity, we definitely have um, treatments. So for nerve pain, we often start with medical therapy um, if it's bothersome. And I always tell people with, with these symptoms, this is really trying to treat what this is trying to treat your symptoms and, and, and any discomfort or effect on your quality of life they're having. Um, there are some people that have minor nerve pain that really doesn't seem to be the biggest driver of their disability or the biggest driver of their quality of life. And I don't tend to treat that um, if, unless it's really needed. But we have a number of medications and, and um, things like gabapentin and duloxetine and some seizure medications can often be helpful for nerve pain. And some of those can also help with spasticity. But in the spasticity realm, you may hear about medications like baclofen or tizanidine being fairly common. For spasticity specifically, I'll also add stretching is critical. I, I think the, the, no matter the degree of your spasticity, getting a stretching regimen is good for all of us. So it's just good advice anyway. But Specifically, if you have some spasticity that's giving you trouble, doing stretching is a is a good line to kind of limber things up and keep it moving. Um, in addition, beyond medical therapy, we can get into some interventions. So there are certain units that are called neuromodulators, like a TENS unit, that can be used in some cases for neuropathic pain. And sometimes people use that because they don't tolerate medications or are on medications and still aren't getting the results they need. And then we can actually, in more severe cases or, or cases where the pain is really a big driver and, and medications have failed, sometimes we can do things like even stimulators. I, I think that's really a, probably a lower percentage for most people, but it is certainly an option. For spasticity, Certainly the, the management can get more aggressive as well. Um, probably the next step for medical therapies for most people is, is doing things like Botox injections. So not just for cosmetic reasons, um, we can do Botox to help um, kind of loosen those muscles up and help things like medications and, and stretching be more effective. Um, and then in the extreme example, somebody who has really severe spasticity that's really impacting their life, um, they can do things like pumps. That like baclofen, they can have actually actual baclofen pumped into around the spinal cord, and that can actually help loosen things up without causing as many side effects. Dr. Gallagher, did I miss anything? No, that was like perfect. I wish I had recorded it for my residents. <laughs> <laughs> no, I that's spot on, and I think kind of the only thing I would add to that is kind of when I'm working with my patients on symptomatic treatment, whether it's you know neuropathic pain, spasticity all these things kind of the, the general rule is like a lot of these medications will quote work, but they do have side effects that, you know, make them hard to either get to a dose that is, is adequate. You know, you run into this with gabapentin a lot where people, by the time they get up to a dose that's like working, they're like, but now I'm a zombie. So in those cases, like the treatment's worse than the actual symptom. And so it is something that just being upfront takes time to really dial in sometimes. And it takes creativity with, with you and the, you know, your honest feedback and, and your provider saying like, okay, like this option didn't work. So let's try something new. Cause you know, the, the side effects were, were too much or things like that. So that's kind of my approach, but I think that was a beautifully comprehensive review. <laughs> thank you well this this is being recorded so if you, if you do want a reference in the future I'll, I'll make sure to send you a link okay thank you both and moving on to our next question 
This person has had TM for 16 years. Their neurologist says the MRI shows no changes, but there are no reasons for why their mobility is getting worse. Does this mean that there's there's something going on? Like what, what would your opinion be in this situation from what little we know? Um, and then this person also wants to know why spasticity progresses over time. Um, yeah. Dr. Kelly, if you wanna. Yeah, yeah, sorry. This is a great question. And it's, it's one that I get um, from my patients where, you know, their, their symptoms do seem to, you know, progress. And even though they're fluctuating, do seem to worsen in time. And it can be, you know, ambulatory issues, walking, balance. It can be, you know, spasticity. It can be their neuropathic pain. And, you know, I've, I've actually, just, just as a slight aside, I'm not sure why this is the case, but I have patients with transverse myelitis who have relatively small, like, lesions and, like, certainly less lesion burden than some of my MS patients. And I don't know why, but those poor patients are still like way symptomatic in comparison to some of my MS patients who you think would be more, but they're not. Maybe one day I'll be able to answer that question. But so we certainly see disease like symptom progression in the setting of image stability. So this story is not one that I would say is different than what I oftentimes see reasons why mobility are getting worse could be could be one of several certainly we see spasticity worsening over time it can be a little bit more refractory a treatment it just may need more aggressive treatment and if things get severe enough you can actually develop more contractures that that can really be difficult to treat if i see somebody who's having worsening mobility despite a, you know, very stable lesion, I typically will kind of ask myself, maybe not necessarily what else is going on from a diagnostic standpoint, you know, because, because I still believe it's idiopathic transverse myelitis. But I tend to also ask myself, like, what else could be going on? Have you developed over time, you know, an underlying peripheral neuropathy that's, that's gone into the balance issues? You know, certainly if, if, patients have what we call proprioceptive issues or, or issues with position sense with their walking, if that's not aggressively worked with, with physical therapy, that's something that can decline over time. So it is something that we, we do see despite normal imaging, and it really is just staying up and staying aggressive with ongoing treatment with, with physical therapy and things like that. One thing I know I run into with my patients Kind of across the board that i'm sure that many of, of you all have probably run into is we right the the number one thing we do with mobility issues is send to physical therapy and physical therapy will work with you for a while get you better they'll say go home and do your exercises which you know is easier said than done but oftentimes once pt is up i, I will see my patients decline again and unfortunately with reimbursement physical therapy they're reimbursed based on like improvement in outcomes. So once you're improved, they discharge you. If there was a way to keep you in physical therapy, you know, every week forever, that's probably the ideal situation. It doesn't happen. But I generally, if I have somebody who's declined again within a year or so, I'll just send them back to physical therapy. So. Great. Yeah, Dr. Brockmarner, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, I absolutely agree. And it's, it's obviously hard to give um, specific advice in a specific situation, but I, I actually encountered a, a situation like this yesterday where somebody had, it didn't actually wind up being transverse myelitis. They had another type of myelopathy, another type of spinal cord injury, but they had experienced some progressive decline. And, and we actually identified just a couple of things that were happening. And one of them was they'd been very medically ill in addition to that and had not been mobile as much as they had been. And I agree with Dr. Galley, where, where I've seen this, where I see this the most is often people who haven't been able to effectively, who haven't been able to carry out a physical therapy plan or, or continue a home exercise plan. So, so I always emphasize to everyone, and I, I'm happy to do it to this audience today, is um, I, we we are not really immune from doing exercise. It's, it's needed for our health status. And, and 
physical therapy is just a very regimented type of exercise if you really get down to it and in some ways so i really encourage people to keep up their home exercise program it, it's just good for your general health anyway but for you it's really critical to maintain function and you know ideally continue to push the boundaries that you've achieved over time so so i really encourage people to keep working at therapy at least some degree of home exercise program every day and and I think the, the the patients that I've had that have been successful at that have really maintained their function. So I, I strongly emphasize that. Great, thank you. Okay, our next question is, I believe, kind of always a hot, a hot topic about stem cells. So is there a near future for the use of stem cells or other injectables to address chronic pain? And this person was particularly interested in particularly interested in the sacral region. Dr. Blackburn, do you want to start us off? Sure, sure. Um, this is certainly a hot button issue, and we talk about it a lot in clinic. So, stem cell therapy for recovery of function, whether it be pain, mobility, improving spasticity, numbness, really just the general recovery of symptoms from a spinal cord injury, it's still very investigational you know, the trials that are ongoing are mostly looking at, I mean, they're, they're still trying to figure out what's the best way to deliver a treatment like this. What's the best way? Can, is that even safe to do? It is kind of where we are. And that's, it's a, that's a, that's going to take a while to overcome. So we're still a ways away from being able to say, inject a stem cell into a spinal cord and have it heal. But it is an area of interest. It is certainly something that's being explored and, and hopefully one day we'll have better answers. Along those lines, as you see, I'm talking about this very cautiously and talking about how it, this is a safe and investigational treatment. So really, if, if someone is offering you stem cells at this point for a fee, usually for injection, I, I often find that those probably aren't using adequate evidence-based techniques. So, so I, advertise, I advise a lot of caution to people who are seeing stem cells advertised as a cure-all for something. At this point, the, we're still investigating these and determining their safety profile. Yeah, I, I have the same kind of feelings and such. I think the only other thing that you guys, you all may, you know, read about or hear about is the use of stem cell transplant with autoimmune conditions. And this is also something that's very early in investigation. And, you know, there is some MS literature that it's a, an effective treatment and really aggressive patients, but it's, it's got potential for quite a bit of, you know, adverse, you know, things, because they're essentially resetting your immune system. So, I think within our field, there's a lot of hope that stem cell, the use of stem cells, either for, for, for treatment of, of the actual in relapsing conditions, the actual relapsing condition, or to use it to regenerate, you know, nerves or help with chronic pain and things like that. I think there's a lot of, of, of hope, but I think we're still very early within that. So. Thank you. Thanks for that explanation. So this person wanted to know, are there any resources for long-term care for TM patients and or resources for caregivers? What advice do you have for long-term TM patients and their medical professionals, families, and caregivers? Dr. Galley, if you want to start us off. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> when I have a, a patient with transverse myelitis, actually the one of the things that I do is actually loop them in with the sRNA for kind of this very reason, because I think, you know, obviously this, you know, I'm, I'm biased because I'm a part of this whole thing, but I think this is an incredible, like, patient, you know, education and advocacy group. So I actually point them here because I think there's a lot of more of the logistical things that, that we as a group are able to offer e even more so than me in clinic. Advice for long-term transverse myelitis patients in general, I think having a care team that you're comfortable with is really key to just long-term 
just just good long term outcomes and not just like from a neurological status, but just a quality of life status. I think establishing yourself a with a really good neurologist is really important and and one that listens to you and and understands your condition and, and kind of is willing to participate in your care and help you through, you know, your, the symptoms and the residual problems that, that came from the initial injury. I, I'm really lucky at my clinic nurse, Tracy Schaefer is a incredible resource for me as she's able to kind of reach out and just check in on my patients, especially if they're like going through a rough patch with whatever, if they're symptom, symptomatically not doing well, or like, even if they're having a rough patch in life for some other totally different reason. But I think with that, like sometimes social work can be really helpful, especially just kind of providing other resources from like a caregiver burnout standpoint and things along those lines. So I really utilize these kind of other resources as well. And then I always kind of put a, a plug in, if you will, for, for a good primary care doctor, which again, my bias is showing my wife's a family medicine doctor, but I have the best outcomes in my patients that have a good primary care doctor because they're able to take care of all the other things and let me focus in on your transverse myelitis and managing those symptoms. And so I have, I have a really, you know, at least at the university of Utah, like we have awesome primary care doctors who I share patients with and, and they're able to manage like things like blood pressure and like cancer screening and things that I, you know, wouldn't be able to tell you about right anymore. So I think those are all really important things to consider. I think that's really, again, I think you did a beautiful job summarizing that. So there's just so much, there's just so many different ways that this disease can impact someone's life that it's, it really spans what we would consider medicine in a way, right? Where we think about focusing on identifying a, a disease and treating the symptoms, but it just impacts so much more than that. And, and I think the SRNA does a great job of plugging you into the things that we're not thinking of in our immediate radar. And I think that's really critical. And, and I do think it's a really good thing to keep caregivers in mind. I think everything you said is perfect. We, we often utilize social work, good primary care to make sure that everybody's getting the care that they need and getting the equipment and, and everything that they need at home. Great, thank you. This next question's kind of specific, but I guess we can also expand it to generally speaking. So this person needs re knee replacement. They just wanna know, is there anything they should know about how this might affect their TM or any considerations? But in general, are there any considerations for surgery and having TM? It's a good question. So I, I always, whenever somebody needs like an orthopedic surgery like this, I think it's one, if, 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 if there, all the other typical interventions have failed, like getting pain relief, physical therapy, all the typical things we're supposed to do before a knee replacement, if, if it's truly gotten to that point, I, I think it's perfectly safe from the standpoint of not exacerbating your myelitis to, to proceed. Again, we've talked about this is a low risk of relapse, but I, so if somebody needs a knee replacement, totally, I feel totally comfortable with them doing that. Knee replacements, I always counsel people, you know, I did my orthopedic surgery rotation. It's, it's not a knee and hip replacements are not minor surgeries and they need a lot of rehab. So you're going to, you may have a different rehab regimen than the average patient that has a knee replacement. But I still, obviously, we talked about the importance of rehab and regular exercise anyway, so I, I totally support it. I don't know that I have any other specific things about surgeries necessarily. I, as far as aging with TM, and I don't know that I have any, any specific guidance there either. Dr. Galley, do you have anything? No, I mean, I think that, you know, when I'm counseling my patients and, you know, again, as, as we age, you know, you need more 
potentially need more joint replacements and things like that. Kind of the discussions always risk benefit, kind of like what you're alluding to. And, you know, the rehab, the rehab may be more difficult than if you didn't have transverse myelitis, especially if you have already have like baseline mobility issues, you know, balance issues, walking issues. But one thing I do discuss with my patients, and it's very individual and case by case, is that could this surgery actually make your mobility better in the long run if we can get you through the rehab, right? Because if, if you have a, a bad knee on top of, you know, balance issues and a little bit of spasticity, that bad knee is going to make it harder. I've certainly had patients that for orthopedic reasons are at a higher fall risk and they get them taken care of and they actually do better. So again, I usually encourage them to, to talk to their orthopedist and kind of get the idea of like what the rehab will entail and things like that. But that's kind of my, my approach to things as well. Great. Thank you both. So this person says they're getting constant feelings of vibration from the waist down, which is uncomfortable and affecting sleep. Is there any way this can be managed or general tips about sleeping with some of these these issues. Um, yeah, yeah, it's not uncommon. So we, we classically, I think that the teaching for, for neuropathic pain is like burning or electrical pain, but this vibration sensation is, is not atypical. And it's certainly one that I see in my patients. Especially, you know, transverse myelitis affects the cord. I certainly see in my EMS population my patients with cord lesions are not just more symptomatic from like a mobility standpoint, but from a pain standpoint, spine lesions just really are painful. Like they, they just are. And it, my, my guess is that your, your, your vibe, this vibration sensation is just more of an a, a typical neuropathic symptom. So in my patients that have, have this sensation or perhaps it's more of that lancinating electrical one, I typically will treat them with neuropathic pain medications. And certainly if it's something that's affecting sleep, you know, my approach is to try to kill two birds, one stone and find, you know, we have certain medications that are actually, they're, they're quite helpful for nerve pain. And the big side effect is they make you super tired. So we utilize that and say, we're gonna use this as a sleep med it'll help hopefully with your nerve pain and maybe it'll knock your headaches out too, <laughs> too. So that's kind of my approach. Sometimes you also just have to, you know, use a sleeping medication along with neuropathic pain meds, but that, that would be my approach if, if you were my patient. No, I absolutely agree. This, this vibrating sensation is something that we hear about a lot. I, I don't think it's been, um, probably acknowledged enough in, in medical literature that this is a, a valid thing that happens, but we, we certainly hear it enough to suggest that it is. And we take the exact same approach, try neuropathic pain meds or sleep aids to see if it'll help. Great. Well, thank you both. Okay. This next person is asking, why can getting overheated trigger symptoms? What do we know about why and how symptoms can change over the course of a long pseudo flare. Dr. Blackburn, if you want to start us off. Sure. So I think it's a really good question why getting overheated can make can cause that worsening of symptoms I was talking about earlier. And I, I don't know how well it's been studied, but I, I think the, the general thought process has been that the heat um, tends to cause the conduction through the nervous system, through those nerves um, to, to be even further impacted. So you already have an injury to these that's impacting conduction and then the heat compounds that. We actually can see that on some of our muscle and nerve tests that temperature, if you're actually too cold on those tests, we can actually see that the peripheral nerves don't fire as well as they should and we try to get you up to temperature. So that it, it works both ways. So you, you know, what do we know about why they change over the course of a long flare? And it sounds like somebody may be alluding to the fact that their symptoms kind of worsened after something like that. Again, I, and I, I, I don't know that I could, I'm trying to 
interpret what they're kind of asking about. But, you know, I, I will say one thing that I've noticed is some people, we always talk about these symptoms completely resolving after the stressors removed, for example, cooling off. But I have had some people who felt that their pain, even after a relapse, they felt that their pain kind of exacerbated in the weeks after that relapse. And I think things like that are, I always tell people sometimes the the healing process or the kind of the inflammation going away, that part of the process sometimes unfortunately brings on some unpleasant things. And that's where spasticity or the pain can actually increase. So I, I think that's what I would counsel in those, that situation. Yeah, I think, I think that's spot on. And, and one thing I also will, you know, discuss with patients is, you know, you, you have a nervous system injury and your, your brain is incredible and can overcome a lot of, a lot of that, but your brain is essentially working overtime constantly trying to make things work. And so any little insult to that system, whether it just be, I have been sleeping well, I'm, I'm sick, even if it's like a mild cold, what have you, like that adds stress into the system and just pulls away the brain's ability to compensate for what is, is that injury. So it's very common. And, and I get this question a lot of like, why in the world, like when I'm stressed and not sleeping well, do, do, does everything pick up? And you're not having new inflammation, but you're just not compensating as well for it. So that's just kind of the way I think about it. When you, you know, if you're having kind of one of these unmasking episodes, if you will, even if it's not heat related. So that's just one other thing that I wanted to kind of add in. Thank you both. Okay, this person wants to know how often they should have an MRI done after being diagnosed with TM. And they also wanna know, is the long-term use of IVIG recommended as a treatment for recurrent TM? Dr. Galley? I was gonna say, I think that one's mine. Um, <laughs> I, so it depends, the, the, the simple answer for your first question is it depends. I typically will do closer repeat imaging if I'm, if in my, you know, patients that I presume are idiopathic transverse myelitis, I, I will typically do an, at least annual imaging for a little while, a couple of years, both brain and spinal cord. Again, that's more just making sure we're not you know, there's not MS or something like that sneaking about. But again, it's very patient dependent and kind of like what my level of concern of clear idiopathic transverse myelitis, or could there be something else going on? I will tell you that like my NMO patients, I don't typically do annual imaging because you, you wouldn't, unless they have new symptoms, I should say just because you wouldn't expect things to kind of go on in the background. MS typically tends to have more annual imaging because MS tends to have more clinically silent lesions, if you will, where you can accrue them in the brain and you just don't notice. That's typically where I'll see them. So that's kind of the way I think about it. It just kind of depends on my level of concern that could you be having, developing something else in the background. But again, with transverse myelitis being monophasic, it's not necessarily something that you have to do annual imaging forever. Again, unless symptoms change. Part of that is patient dependent. If I have a patient who's really worried that, and they wanna do annual imaging, I don't say no. I think it's pretty harmless. And then the question about long-term use of IVIG and recurrent TM kind of gets back to what we were saying earlier. If somebody has recurrent transverse myelitis, I'm going back to the drawing board to say what is causing this, because that is going to drive my treatment. I will tell you right now, the the and Dr. Blackburn, I don't know if you guys are on the, the IVIG train for your MOG patients, but right now I can tell you our group is is pretty heavy on using IVIG first line for MOG. That may change in six months, everybody. So I'm just gonna put that out there as well. But it really depends, and that's where finding the reason for the relapsing is important because if somebody's having relapsing, you know, transverse myelitis and, and we're missing like a sarcoidosis, that's something that I'm going to treat completely differently than, it's, than I would MOG, which I'm going to treat completely different than MS, which I'm going to treat completely different from, from NMO. So I, I 
I hope that answers the question. So if I if I saw someone with a current transverse myelitis, I'd really be wondering why to help guide what treatment to use. Mm -hmm. and, and I absolutely agree. I, the, the MRI frequency after a diagnosis of TM is really determined by, is there a risk of relapse or is there, has somebody come to us with already three or four MRIs that, that suggest stability, for example. So uh, in those cases, if I've been very suspicious for MS, Dr. Galley was talking about, absolutely. We would be doing interval imaging to look for those silent lesions he was talking about. For other causes, it may be a little less frequent and only if symptoms recur. As he, as he was talking about. And then with the IVIG question, yeah, we, we are on the IVIG train for, Mo, for MOGAD, so we will commonly use that. But we, as far as a first line treatment, um, if somebody, let's say that we're catching somebody with an acute recurrence and we're talking about what, what are we going to treat with them within the hospital, you know, I, the evidence on these things is limited, but we IVIG, I think, is a is a perfectly reasonable thing to try for an acute exacerbation of transverse myelitis if we don't feel that we know the cause. Oftentimes, you'll see steroids used in these cases, and I would strongly advocate for that as well. But IVIG, if somebody were to say, You're, I'm in the hospital for an acute exacerbation and I have myelitis, if, if they had received IVIG, I would think, okay, that's that's a reasonable thing to do in general. Okay, great, thank you. Next question is about cognitive issues. So what is the best support for cognitive issues? Dr. Blackburn? Well, that's a really good question and, and not something I expected to see on the transverse myelitis uh, discussion, but we're here. So cognitive issues can really have a lot of different causes. and. So, so the first thing I want to add is, uh, in many cases, this is not the, the, for many people that have had transverse myelitis, they're having cognitive issues. It's often not necessarily a sign that they're having Alzheimer's disease. Let's say, for example, um, we see cognitive issues due to a variety of things. So when, when somebody can't, comes to me and says, I have a cognitive symptom, we obviously want to do some testing to figure out why that is. Uh, I, I will counsel you that some of the best testing takes several hours to administer it's, and it, it makes everybody feel dumb at the end of it, to be frank. So don't walk away from it feeling like you are, that you failed in a way. There's really is no way to fail it, but cognitive, that's usually the first thing is to get a better understanding. And it's, those are administered by a, a medical professional type called a neuropsychologist who can often give us a lot of great information. They, they're trained in both assessing the mood disorders in addition to cognitive disorders in many cases. And they, they're often able to provide us some insights. Common things that I see our patients um, struggling with if they get testing or just in general from a cognitive standpoint, one of them is kind of their energy levels. We, we know that, the, that fatigue is very common in these disorders. And a manifestation of fatigue that sometimes people feel is just as they exert themselves, they will, they'll notice that they either feel more tired, kind of a physical sensation that they want to go to sleep, or they feel that they cognitively just cannot do more complex tasks. And that, that can be managed. Fatigue management is, is a very tailored approach. But if, if we think that the source of a lot of these cognitive issues is fatigue, we can treat that. Another thing aspect that I think is underappreciated are the mood disorders and sleep and how those can impact your cognition. So oftentimes when somebody is saying that they're reporting some issues with their cognition, I'll often ask them about sleep. You know, if, if somebody has been on a bunch of steroids for a while, we worry about things like sleep apnea, if there's been weight gain. So we have, we want to certainly assess for that, but also just making sure that their sleep patterns haven't been affected by being in a hospital or something of that nature. Because certainly, if I think we've all experienced this, if you're not sleeping well, your thinking and memory processes just aren't going to work well. And then mood disorders can have a profound impact on your ability to um, process information effectively. So we also tend to focus on that. Those are just kind of some of the general things. Uh, obviously, this gets a little more specific if we're talking about inflammation that's impacted the brain and has caused injury to the memory circuits at which point we may recommend interventions like rehabilitation or speech therapy to help. But 
in general, for these disorders, I think the those are where I tend to find the cognitive issues deriving from. Spot on. <laughs> I totally agree with all that. It's really, I think for, for me, it's really, you know, optimizing everything that can contribute to cognitive issues is really an mainstay in this. And, and the neuropsych testing can really help see what's what's underlying it. And I think also offer reassurance oftentimes in patients to be able to say, based on this, you definitely don't have Alzheimer's disease. I think that's usually our biggest concern. Great. Thank you. I think we probably have time for about one more. So we just have a few minutes left. So let's see which ones we have left. Let's go with this one. Back to diagnosis and diagnosis changing. This person has received several different diagnoses, recurring TM, MS, maybe neuropsychosis. But this person wants to know if it's worth taking medication. Yeah, they're obviously feeling frustrated because their diagnosis keeps changing and their disability is progressing. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, this, I don't want to say it's, it, it's not uncommon because usually once somebody's diagnosed with MS, that's a correct diagnosis. But I actually, as an example, I inherited a patient who carried an MS diagnosis for you know, five years, we'll say. And they actually kept having recurrent optic neuritis despite being otherwise adequately treated. Now they weren't on, you know, CD20 therapy, but they were just not behaving like MS should, if you will. And so in that case, we actually went back to the drawing board. I evaluated him and actually ended up saying, I think this may be more likely to be neurosarcoid switched his treatment and has been much more stable. So this does happen. And I will tell you, neurosarcoid in general is something that you kind of always have to have in the back of your mind as a provider, especially when things aren't responding to treatment as well. You know, I would love to have a crystal ball where I could just nail a diagnosis every time, get on the right treatment, but we don't. So. In this case, I certainly think it's worth taking the medication that you're being recommended with knowledge that sometimes it takes us time to get to the bottom of your diagnosis. And really that's to hopefully allow for you to, to improve from a functional standpoint, but also to prevent further disease progression. I absolutely agree. And one of the frustrating things that we're, we're dealing with is that we don't have that crystal ball. And maybe that, maybe that's where we need to invest the rest of our time and resources is getting that. Because this is a, this, this, sometimes this process, while we're getting better and better, this process can be frustrating. It, it can be really hard to nail it the first time. And if somebody is experiencing worsening, then I, then I absolutely think it's, that would indicate especially if providers are pointing out that they're seeing new evidence on MRI scans, that there is, there is something inflammatory that seems to be taking bites out of the spinal cord in this case. And I would absolutely advocate for doing some sort of treatment. Um, even if your doctors are, are saying that this is something that we're going to try empirically and try to figure out as we go along, I, I think it's, it's good that they're being honest with you and, and telling you these are the things that we're thinking about but that they're not 100% certain yet themselves. You really want doctors that will be transparent about that. So absolutely, if somebody is progressing like this, I think taking treatment's reasonable. Great, thank you both so much. Unfortunately, we're at the end of our time, but I think this is a great discussion and hopefully we can continue this conversation in the future and possibly answer a few of the questions we didn't get to in a podcast, if you would be interested. <laughs> not to not to nail you down but thank you both and um, for everyone attending thank you for submitting questions and and participating <laughs>